The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Hi, I'm Lori Vismara. Uh, I'd like to thank Autism Research Institute for inviting me to give this talk. And I'd like to thank you for joining me for the next hour on telehealth strategies for early intervention. Um, I want to begin just by noting that parents play an important role in how their children learn. And therefore, finding methods to help parents use early intervention is critically important. The pandemic, though, has made doing anything in person, early intervention included, very difficult. And so my hope is today, uh, or I hope today, is to explore ways in which uh, you may use telehealth to coach families in early intervention. And hopefully to, you find that you have a few more tools um, at the end of our hour together than before for accomplishing that. Okay, let's get this working. Okay. So I want to just disclose that I do receive royalties as uh, a co-author of the two books you see on your screen. Uh, the first, uh, the top book is, is or the top book on, on the screen is based on uh, interactive strategies in the Early Start Denver model uh, that we wrote to hopefully provide parents with practical and enjoyable strategies to engage their children in learning and, uh, and, and building skills. Uh, things that parents can do on their own um, inside the routines and the moments they already have with, with, with their children. And then the other book on the screen is our soon to be published book of ESDM coaching practices, uh, many of which I'll, I'll talk on or touch on today in this talk, uh, that we aim for early intervention providers or early childhood educators to use in order to support families. Uh, Autism Research Institute has provided me with an honorarium to give this talk, so just to disclose that. And I have no non-financial disclosures. So Denise uh, already introduced um, or provided a, a little bit of, about my back, background, but I just want to note that I've had the privilege to work in early autism intervention and research for close to 20 years. Uh, currently, I do a lot of telehealth uh, in working closely with families. Uh, in providing consultation to early intervention pro programs and university-conducted research studies. So our, our time together is going to focus on three topics. I want to start by providing a little bit of background and rationale for why and how we provide coaching in an early intervention setting. And with that foundation in mind, moving into the qualities and characteristics coaches use to help families achieve their learning outcomes from early intervention. And then how we can translate that foundation of coaching and the key elements uh, behind coaching practices into telehealth with families, since obviously a worldwide quarantine and lockdown measures have led the need for a lot of mental health services, including early intervention to increasingly rely on technology in order to continue working with and supporting families. You know, whereas interrupting ongoing services or just putting families on hold is just not a solution. So early intervention is actually one of the few settings in which coaches have a federal law as well as federal regulations through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that guide how we're to be providing our services and our supports. And I should say I'm speaking um, uh, within the United States as this context. One of the key provisions of that law is a natural environment provision. As you can see on the screen, the definition indicates that we as coaches are to provide our services in locations where young children would be if they did not have disabilities. And that starts first and foremost with families in their homes and inside the typical routines they do, the way that they spend their time together, extending out to community settings that families and young children, where families and young children go, like to the park or grocery store or running errands, uh, and to other early childhood contexts like childcare or preschool. 
There's also key principles on how we provide our services in those natural environments, in those uh, already existing locations to support young children's learning. So young children learn best through the everyday interactions that they have with the important people in their lives. And so think about this. If we as coaches were to provide our services to a, a child or a family, let's say one time a week, or two hours a week, or a few times slash hours a week, we still could not match the amount of time that the child spends with his or her family and other important people in the child's lives. So we wanna put our coaching resources and our supports into those families, into the hands of those families and the other important relationships in children's early lives. So more opportunities for practice, for learning and skill building can take place. Telehealth has the potential to support these active ingredients for family learning and skill building. So we're gonna talk about how that looks, how we do that, but before, I wanna just kinda of get on the same page about what I mean by telehealth. And telehealth goes by different names, telemedicine, remote learning, distance learning, e-learning, all of it though relates to using technology to distribute health-related services and information. And for the context of this talk, we're focused on early intervention. Now there's two modalities in which telehealth can be used. We have asynchronous learning, and that does not require real-time interaction. Instead, the content or the communication is available online. And so it's convenient to access when, when someone's ready, like watching a recorded webinar once, for example, like with this talk, once ARI puts it on their website, or sending an email to someone. Those are examples of asynchronous learning. Then there's synchronous, and that's where interaction happens in real time. Like if we FaceTime a family member or a friend, or we use a video conferencing program like Zoom to coach families. It's also possible to do a hybrid, to use both types of modalities, um, especially in early intervention with families. So we might do weekly video conferencing sessions, uh, followed by families accessing uh, materials, online materials on their own to go through at their own pace. There's a lot to talk about and to cover when we're pre preparing for telehealth and our early intervention practice. And I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I can't do that uh, with just or within one hour. I just I won't I can't cover all I'm sure all of the questions and thoughts out there. So I want to reference this other webinar um, that's uh, available on YouTube in case this would be a, an additional resource to help uh, explain and walk you through telehealth related logistics for, for providing early intervention to families. And this webinar is from Anna Dvorak, who is a speech language, language pathologist and autism specialist in Portland, Oregon. And Brooke Ingersoll um, is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Michigan State University. And she runs a research lab there. Uh, they're both developers of a parent-mediated intervention for children with autism spectrum disorder called Project Impact. And in this uh, almost hour and a half webinar, they'll walk you through the bullet points you see listed on the slide. So again, that's available. It's currently on YouTube. And for anyone just wanting more information, other ideas about telehealth uh, uh, options and, and logistics to provide early intervention, I would encourage you to check out this talk. I'm gonna get into the nuts and bolts of telehealth coaching. Um, and so what I wanna start with in this vision is what remains the same uh, when we're coaching families at a distance. And that is our primary role as coaches in early intervention. We're still there to ideally help mobilize families' experiences for learning. So helping parents think through and realize what they're doing now that works to teach their child, to help build and grow children's skills, as well as what other opportunities uh, families have and what they already do or might try with their child to extend opportunities for learning and for um, practicing or furthering skills. And with those two um, frames of, of mind together, we're building capacity. We're, you know, when we, when we talk about capacity building, 
uh, skills at no matter our age, the, the, the principle remains the same that the more we do something, the more we're going to feel capable of continuing to use it, of wanting to use it. And as we keep practicing, we're going to develop more independence, more fluidity to achieve our outcome, to achieve what we, you know, what we hope to see happen now and in the future. And that's really key because our role as coaches with families isn't long term. You know, it has a start and a, and a stop to it. And so we want to think as we're coaching families, how to help families feel confident, capable, successful, and independent, not just when we're there, but when we're not there outside of our sessions. There's also things with telehealth coaching that are very different. And so let's, let's note what some of those are. Comfort and what our experience up to date has been with technology, it varies. It varies for us as coaches, and it can certainly vary um, on the receiving end or the other end of that camera for parents. And so I think it's important to, again, recognize that, recognize where we as coaches are with our comfort and, and previous experience with technology and what we may do to improve that if we're you know, feeling um, a little uncomfortable with that or, or unsure of how to proceed. So if we have colleagues we can, we can practice with or, or talk through uh, our thoughts or in a supervision manner to help gain more experience and then posing those same questions to families you know where their comfort and experience what their comfort level is like and experience with technology what stands out to them that might um, it, uh, that might create some uh, discomfort or reluctance in wanting to use technology with us um, to to pursue early intervention you know we, we want to again recognize what the feelings that parents may have, not as a reason to dismiss um, or abandon technology, but to try to find solutions through it. Uh, and if there are considerations we can make to tailor content a little bit, you know, in a different way, um, or to help shape, shape parents' experiences more positively so that we can still connect with them. We're also trying to build now a virtual coaching relationship as opposed to being in the same room with, with parents and, and other, uh, well, parents, family members, other, again, um, caretakers um, or adults in the child's life. And that can, you know, talking with a parent um, over technology and, and through a camera, it can, it can take some time to kind of find one's rhythm with communication you know, when to talk and when to listen, kind of that, that pause and, and back and forth nature. It can take some practice to spend some time to help feel like you're, you are in fact building rapport, but I want to emphasize it as possible. And again, the tools I aim to share with you today are trying to kind of work through um, any potential barriers so that a relationship can form um, and, and, and trust can start to develop between uh, coaches and parents. Um, to make early intervention feel comfortable and successful and achievable with parents' goals. We as coaches, when we're coaching families virtually or, or at a distance, we can't model with children. And, you know, that can be, feel like we're at a disadvantage because we're comfortable a lot of times modeling with children. And we can get a lot of teaching opportunities to the child when we're there in person for our session or visit. So it can feel like we're being really productive and, um, and lots of learning is happening quickly through modeling. But I actually think that because we can't model in telehealth, it forces us as, it gives us an opportunity here as coaches. It forces us to flex our other coaching muscles on how to help parents understand and use the strategies and to encourage parents' ideas and their feedback instead of us potentially leading or directing parents what to do next. And again, I'll go into some tools. Oops, um, talking with parents may also have to kind of happen a little differently in telehealth coaching sessions than in-person sessions. Because again, a main difference is we're not in the same room as the parent and child. And so, you know, we're not there as extra hands to maybe help support a child when it is time to talk one-on-one -on -one with a parent. And that may lead us to kind of rethink how we organize a telehealth session um, to make sure we still hold on to some talking time with parents, but that, but that it's not um, a negative experience for a child then when we need to talk um, and not engage them 
directly into an activity. The types of, of, of learning materials we share with parents um, sometimes has to be kind of rethought or, or planned out a little bit differently so that visually the information is easy to understand. Um, it, it fits the screen well, um, especially for parents who share with us that they are very much visual learners. And, you know, sometimes as we're talking through a, a topic or explaining a strategy, being able to pull something up on our screen, like what you see um, this example in front of you, you know, to, to kind of see the common language, the common words that you want to define for a parent and then work together on how the parent might want to use that. So thinking about your screen space as, as you know, valuable real estate and how to land on formats that are going to look friendly to the parent. Um, there are some asynchronous or, or you know, uh, online learning materials that parents can access um, to learn about particular intervention models. And I just want to highlight a few in case um, these are ones that you may want to uh, include in your coaching practice with families. So help, and it, so help is in your hands is uh, based from the interactive strategies and uh, from the Early Start Denver model on how to help address young children's social communication challenges. Um, the modules there that it covers are listed. It's a publicly available website. Uh, so you just have to create your own login account and then you'll have access to text and video modules um, that, again, anyone can go through at their own pace, but you as the coach could mirror uh, alongside your coaching sessions with families. And it has checklists, practice ideas, a lot of um, interactive content despite it being online and um, and as an asynchronous material. And then Affirm is autism-focused intervention resources and modules. Again, they've got um, module, uh, modules on, on several or many different evidence-based practices uh, for uh, children with autism. And they also, I'll, I'll highlight, they have a COVID-19 toolkit there. So again, it's a, it's a free resource. And Autism Navigator has uh, courses and videos for families and professionals, some of which is free, others are at a price. So again, just some other tools. Uh, potentially at your disposal. And then data collection, how we measure progress for both parents and children may need to be rethought when we're talking about telehealth coaching. And um, what we can what we as the coach are able to feasibly see on our side of the screen, uh, in addition to what parents, you know, still report with us that they're seeing from their child. So I'll get into some examples too as we as we proceed in the talk. Um, the coaching quality, so let's talk about now how we coach families, the kinds of qualities that we want to, whoops, sorry, jumped ahead for me. Okay, the types of qualities that, um, that we want to try to, again, flex with families, particularly since modeling isn't at the forefront for us. And this may be the opportunity to shift our role a bit in terms of how we coach. So borrowing the definition of coaching from Ham, Rush, and Sheldon, I think about coaching as a voluntary, non-judgmental, collaborative relationship um, where people are working together to help learn new knowledge and skills from the other. So it's not just a coach, it's not just a one directional relationship where the coach is just supplying all of the ideas and tools and information to the parent. It's a partnership relies on shared input and decisions made jointly from each side having specialized knowledge to bring to the table. So coaches, you as a coach, have expertise on how to help children develop and how to use capacity building coaching techniques to support parents as, a, as adult learners toward their desired outcomes. Uh, for parents joining us here, you have expertise on your child, on your family, on yourselves, you know, what's important to you, um, how you learn best, what works, what doesn't work with your lifestyle and needs, and how you envision using the coaching information, the early intervention uh, content in your home. And so we want both sides to share this input. And in order for that to ho happen, coaches have to create the space have to create the space for parents and, and other caretakers uh, in that child's life to contribute. Uh, you know, who makes up the family, um, the family unit uh, that surrounds this child? 
uh, what matters to each most out of the early intervention experience, what their day looks like, both inside the home and, and outside the home, um, out in the community, how each person in, in, um, in the coaching relationship prefers to learn. So we as coaches do this because we want to acknowledge and respect parents and other caretakers as adult learners, not child learners, as adult learners. And as adults, we all have assumptions for parents about, you know, for, it's for parents, it's about how their child likes to learn, um, what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, and also about what our role is as coaches, what our role is in supporting them. So how do we do that? How do we create that space? We ask. We ask parents what skills are important that they see their child develop. We ask parents to help us think through the sources of learning opportunities for them to work on with, again, the skills that reflect their priorities for who they want their child to be. We want to take that context, that family context, that community context that, that, uh, that parents give us, and to help share examples, again, of what that could look like throughout the day. You know, is it, if, if parents bring up um, laundry, you know, what's, um, or, or maybe that's in our idea in a way, like laundry time could be something that we could work on together to help build particular skills. You know, to the family, what could that look like? What could be something that we help children um, learn inside that routine? Or maybe parents share with us how hard it is to brush their child's teeth. And so that's an opportunity to, uh, or a moment that we want to work on together. Um, bath time, walking the dog, going for a walk, swinging on the swing, playing with brother. All of these are sources for learning. So we ask to find out what that could, what that is, what that could look like. And then we listen. We listen to this input. We take in what parents share. And we build, we build from their values, their priorities, um, what they're telling us is important out of this early intervention experience. And we want to provide the strategies that we know to be important for children's development that they can practice inside the learning moments they choose and toward, toward the desired outcomes they want to see in their child. So creating the space, it helps parents want to learn and practice what we want to share with them. We're actually trying to make ourselves as coaches re reinforcing the parents because we're, again, we're listening. We're, we're accepting what it is they're sharing with us and letting them know we hear you. And so that's going to hopefully enhance that positive experience to help again build that rapport in spite of the, the physical distance that we as coaches recognize parents as adult learners that they are a part of the process, and hopefully, then they want to be. They want to be there. They, they're more invested in it, in it. And then we're going to build capacity. We want again that uh, we want. Anytime we're building skills, we want someone to feel confident with it. We want someone to feel competent, so it feels good to me. I understand it. I know how to do it, and I can think about it and and apply it on my own not just when someone is there, now and in the future. The more independence a person has, to, the more they're likely they're going to achieve. And the research on coaching is actually really clear about five research-based practices that when they're used together and used with fidelity, meaning that um, a coach in this case is applying these practices as they're intended to be used with consistency, with quality, that, that's, that these skills together are gonna help build parents' confidence, their competence, and their independence from learning, and using them the early intervention strategies with their child. So we're going to, so let me just name them, um, just to make sure they're visible or that they're clear, but these five are joint planning, observation, action slash practice, and that's going to embed or include some feedback from the coach. Reflection also includes some feedback and problem solving. Okay, so we're going to talk about what that, how we apply each of these practices inside a telehealth session. Um, there's going to be video I show um, to illustrate these practices too, and 
you'll have to bear with me because I'm going to have to do a little maneuvering on my end to try to make the video as clear and as audible as possible to you. So I'll just thank you in advance for your patience and your understanding. Okay, so joint planning, it sets the focus of each coaching session. We want to revisit the last plan we set at the start of each session. And we, because we want to find out how, well, what parents used from that plan and how did that go? You know, what worked for parents? Um, what did not work as well? Uh, you know, what did they, what did they notice from their child? Uh, what did they notice uh, in themselves as they used it? Or what maybe stood in their way of practicing that plan? So we want to take in that input, that feedback that parents are sharing with us, and we want to acknowledge what, what we're hearing them, them tell us. What's working, what's not working, what may need to be thought out a little differently. And we're, at this point, we're refraining from getting into, into specific coaching because we don't yet have the full picture of what's potentially going on for the parent and the child. This, this conversation starts to give us an idea and the rest of the picture is hopefully, hopefully gonna come uh, after we observe, after we get into the next coaching practice. Um, I'm gonna just make a little, and so sometimes as I'm walking, through, walking you through these practices, I'll just share um, some experiences I've had. So this bullet point about typing notes is a, a personal experience I've had that sometimes when parents are sharing with me in, in this joint planning stage, I like to take notes, it helps me um, kind of think through and digest and organize what I want to say back to a family and, and what I'm hearing. And so as I'm doing telehealth sessions, I'll, I'll sometimes have um, my, my notes um, or my session plan elect on the screen um, next to my video conferencing window. And so I'll type and I've realized watching back um, some of my sessions that unless I mute my mic or, or mute my audio, um, when parents are talking, me typing, or the sound of me typing can be very distracting, and parents can hear that. And you're gonna actually see that uh, played out in this video example. So it's just a little note that, um, again, you know, we learn things as we, as we try them. And so, in, so now what I do is when I wanna take notes, I'm, I'm either conscious of when I do that inside the session so I can mute myself, um, or I, pick up and use a traditional pencil to note something down instead of typing it. Um, okay, so this, um, this child is uh, 27 months old. Um, he's with his mother here in the video. I have, um, I should also say, I have written um, permission from, from all the families to show uh, video and share video for, for teaching purposes. Um, so so this, that's important for me to disclose. And, in this video, I want to highlight how I check in with the mother at the very start of our telehealth coaching session. Hi, good morning. Good morning. How are we today? Um, good, good. We're pretty good. Good. We're just waking up. Okay. May we chat for just a minute to check in while he's waking up? Yes. Great. So yesterday, as you know, and I'll just, I always like to have a little visual, but we, our focus was topic one, again, strategies on how to step into the spotlight. And as we ended yesterday's session, we were talking about ways in which, um, in which you want to be practicing this. Uh, Esteban to, to support just in a particular activity. So I'm just curious for, for what's, Obviously, just a short time from yesterday to this morning, but anything you want to share with me around that, that maybe you've done, um, you did after or something yesterday? Um, yesterday, um, I, well, it, it, it's just because I used in a lot, in a lot of um, uh, activities. Um, mm -hmm. One of the, the activities that I used it to, it was when I was changing him because um, oh, always that I, when I change in him, it's hard for him to stay, like he will move, he will, sometimes he will make a mess. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so um, I was um, practice with, uh, with him on the, on the well, I changed him. Mm -hmm. I was, um, before I changed him, um, I, I, I told him that, that I was gonna change him 
and uh, and by himself he laying on the floor for chase him. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, I, like, I was doing step by step, so I was, like, taking the path, and then I was telling him what I was going to do, mm -hmm. uh, and he was looking at me, like, he w because I was talking to him, and, I, and he was looking at me, mm -hmm. and I was uh, telling him, and I was in front of him, of course, uh, mm -hmm. and then, um, okay, so hopefully saw and heard from that example is me asking the mother, um, well, first of all, bringing up a, a visual point of reference of what our last plan, had, uh, the strategies from, from our last plan, um, and the mother's part of a research study, so it just so happened that I was connecting with her the following day from when we first went through that information um, to find out, again, you know, if there had been any potential moment for her to, to try out that plan, to practice it. And she shared with me that in fact, she had. It was um, during a, a routine that in the past, or up until this day that she, or yesterday when she tried it, had been really challenging for, for her to do with, with her son, and that is changing his diaper. Um, you know, he doesn't like, didn't like it, would run away, not wanna uh, lay down and, and and just not make the steps easy for her to do. And so she was applying the strategies we had we had talked about um, and and thought through together of how she might use it into this new situation, to this new moment she thought of entirely on her own. And with great success, he cooperated. He um, he had some uh, little toys and a little book he could hold on to as she was as changing him. It came out later in the conversation. And uh, she felt, hopefully you saw from, you know, saw her smile on her face, that she felt really proud, proud of her son and proud of herself. Probably also heard a little bit of a clicking noise. Again, that was me typing, taking notes, realizing after the fact, uh, it's distracting and don't do it. Okay, so after parents share with us um, what they've seen so far, we want to, we want to have an opportunity to see what that looks like. And so we want parent, uh, a parent and child to, to show us something from that plan, you know, inside a typical activity or an interaction or a moment that they, um, that they have done or that they might want to try now uh, with us watching. And again, a little side note is that when I observe, I sometimes will turn off my camera, um, especially if my face on the side of the screen can be distracting to the child. Um, or if I, you know, if a, if, it, if a parent, again, is shared with me or through conversation about how we can become more comfortable with technology and with video conferencing, if a parent shares that that would make him or her feel less awkward by me watching um, or just help a parent kind of focus more on a child and not be distracted seeing my face. So turning off your camera is just an option I put out there. Um, I do mute my audio because when I'm watching and uh, in, this, in this part of the session, I do want to take some notes. Um, particularly, I also want to take some data. So parent fidelity, um, just talking or noting about what, how I'm seeing the parent use the strategies that we that have been a part of our plans and that we've practiced and coached up until this point to see where they are with it and what's again working for them, what's not working, and how a child is progressing across goals. I. While I'm watching a parent-child activity, um, sometimes I'll just make a quick little comment just to acknowledge what I'm seeing. And also for my voice to just still come through to mark my presence versus just watching in silence, I, it feels uh, uncomfortable for me to not say anything. Mm -hmm. So it's a way just to kind of help still have a little connection with the parent, maybe to make, again, watching um, less, uh, less awkward for, for a parent. But I'm refraining from coaching because I want to, again, try to get a full picture of that activity or interaction between the parent and child. And so once, uh, once I've observed um, and there's either a natural point where the activity comes to the end or there's a moment where I can now uh, turn my camera back on and unmute myself to join the parent and child, then we'll start to talk through um, what it is I observed and what the parent has shared with me. And from those two sources of input, a coaching focus emerges of 
what we're going to do in the current session together. And maybe that's sticking with the same plan we have already set up. Um, maybe it's with a slight twist to that plan because we're gonna add another strategy to practice or some other goals um, to work on uh, or other ways to vary that plan. Or maybe we're coming into a brand new topic and that's going to result in a brand new plan. So you're going to see the same mother from the last video with the same child in this clip. And um, what, oh, the reason why I wanted to share this video is we're leading, we've already done our check-in conversation. And now we're coming to the point of the session where she's going to share something with me. I'm going to observe something. And the mother, it may not come clear, so I want to just say, I want to repeat what she says. She asks me, well, what do you want to see? And see, that's a, that was so interesting to me how she phrased it as such, because she's asking out of you know good intentions to, to show me something I want to see. But I want to be careful that I don't create this pattern here where I decide everything, where I make these decisions for what the parent should show me. I want to empower the parent to tell me what they want me to watch, you know, what's on their mind, what's something they're um, excited to show me, or something that's maybe been that they've struggled with or, or haven't had a chance to practice. So I want to share uh, or, or encourage the parent to help think through and to help make these decisions, not waiting for me to tell um, the parent what it is I want to see. So that's what's going to come out in just the first bit of this video example. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want me just to keep playing with those? Oh, no. So what do you want to do? Uh, so just to be clear, she says, "Do you want me to? Do you want me to keep playing with this little thing?" And then I respond back, "Well, what do you want to do?" Uh, <laughs> let me. <laughs> yeah, I was playing with the cards here, and then when we go to the ground, uh, we can play with bubbles. I would say. I'm excited to see both. Yeah. Okay. So that was just, again, I know it's quick, but for time, I wish I have to be um, brief here. But it's just a way for me to not leave her dangling as to what she should show, but to give her a chance to kind of think, again, create the space. Um, so now then, so once we have our coaching focus, we want to practice that. We want to build off, again, the skills for the strategies we want a parent to use and the types of behaviors and and um, and goals that with those skills we want to see the child develop or strengthen. And we're going off of again parent input for how they want to practice the coaching content. You know, what what activity or moment stands out to them that would be most practical or useful to try with their child. Um, what they think again is going to matter most to them. And then as we coach, we're acknowledging what it is parents and the parent and child are doing. We're acknowledging all the effort made and the success. And when we see an opportunity to help improve skills, parent and child skills, we want to give quick feedback. We want to give quick, quick feedback because we don't want to disrupt the activity, the interaction that's happening between the parent and child. We want to increase momentum and, and again, uh, a parent closer to feeling confident and capable and independent with that skill and then things that are going to require a little more or require discussion from the parent we want to save for the next phase of coaching which is the reflection period and as we practice we want to make sure we get in different opportunities for parents and other um, uh, other adults other partners important in that child's life to um, to again build and increase their skill set so that might be practicing across different um, with different types of toys or outside of toy play, like in other routines and opportunities that happen throughout the day, dressing, meals, diapering. Um, uh, if, if, if your Wi-Fi is good enough to, or the parent's Wi-Fi is good enough to go outside in the backyard. Um, so thinking again about how to generalize opportunities for learning. The parent's goal in this is how to work on engaging her child in an activity that they can do together, the child's not gonna leave, and how to start working on ways the child can participate through watching what the mother's doing, um, through making choices, through gesturing. Um, so we'll see some quick examples of that. And then give her the marker. You can ask her marker and she's with the color. You want marker? 
Ella, do you want to mark it? You want to color it? Or take another turn to color and try again. If her eyes aren't on you, try again. Ooh, what else should we draw? <gasps> We're going to draw a duck. Ooh. Oh, kind of looks like a bird. A duck. I'm impressed already. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, wait, see? Okay. So she's watching. You want to color? You want to color? Marker? Or ask her if she wants you to draw. Does she want you to draw another duck? You can point to the duck. Duck. You want another duck? Another duck? Mm -hmm, exactly. Another tree? Which one is she looking at? Can you? Oh, oh there. there. Tree. Okay, okay, great. And draw the tree. Tree. Yes, yeah, she just told you. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, tree. Okay. So, some quick examples there of how to help the mother um, work closer towards uh, kinds of behaviors you want. She wants to see her daughter do. Watching what she's drawing, staying inside of it, not getting up and leaving the activity, and starting to make starting to make choices. Starting to tell the mother, "Yeah, I do want you to draw this." She points to um, a, a tree that her mother had already drawn. Just minimize this. Okay, so after each practice, we want to invite parents to share, we want to reflect with parents. We want to invite parents to share and talk through their experiences of what that practice was like. Um, you know, what stood out to them, what they felt comfortable with, what helped move them closer to their goals, and what maybe was different than what they expected or stood in their way. And so I'm gonna, so, Thinking as a coach about the types of tools we have to encourage that reflection to help parents or any of us really take a deeper look at ourselves. Uh, let's go through some examples here. We have um, we have four types of, of, of reflection or reflective questions and statements we can use. And awareness is where we want to help a learner, in this case the parent, identify what it is they know. You know, what have you tried before? Something we could we could ask. Or how did that work? I think it's also an opportunity with awareness, with the kinds of statements we can use, to provide positive observations that in every interaction we see a parent and child doing together, we as the coaches, we wanna find something positive to highlight. And we wanna help link that, what the, link what the parent did to, what, to how the child responded. You know, okay, you mentioned having a hard time thinking of what to do with toys. And I noticed this time you imitated your child and he really, you know, you, you watched what he did and you copied his play. He really enjoyed that. He stayed in the activity. He, he did his action again. He looked at you and smiled. It seemed to take some pressure off, uh, off of you to come up with the ideas. So pointing out the strengths and efforts from the parent, you know, it, it, we're really trying to make changes here, not just for the child, but for the parent too, right? To help, again, increase certain actions they do or to help change some patterns or behaviors towards things that they want um, to make different with their child or to, to skills they want to help, again, build and encourage in their child. And that takes, that's being vulnerable. Parents are being vulnerable with us when they're sharing that. And so we want to point out um, anything and everything that they're doing to get closer to those outcomes. Analysis questions helps kind of dig deeper uh, into what's going on. So why do you think that happened? Uh, why do you think he did that? What do you think she's learning right now? Or how, how does this compare to how you really want it to look? Alternative questions are coming up with ideas. It's brainstorming. You know, what else could we try? Uh, what new ideas would you like to do from, from what we've been doing today? And then action is about getting into, again, go mode. You know, how would you like to practice? Or based on what we've done today, what, you know, what's your plan? Um, you know, how do you want to keep using this from now until next time we meet? So we're, we're encouraging the parents to talk about their experience, to share their thoughts, their ideas. We're tying what they did with how their child responded. And we want to make sure that, that as this conversation happens, that it's feeding into a plan of what parents want to keep using or what we need to rethink or change or do differently that aligns with parents' parenting practices, with their values, their cultural beliefs, their, um, 
what's again what's important to them what stands out to them and if we need to pull up material sometimes it's helpful especially for visual learners as we reflect to go back to kind of our talking points go back to the content we're trying to you know help them use in the ways that are most important to them so these are just some visual examples like you know as a parent's talking with me about what stands out i might type it on the shared screen um, this is written from the parent's perspective. So I is the parent. I notice that when I involve my child in setting the in setting up the activity, you know, setting up his play, he helps. He's more eager and focused to participate. I notice that when I label actions or object words um, to ask my child how to take, you know, my turn, I want to pull a child into taking, you know, telling me how should I take my turn. He points or he touches or vocalizes to tell me what to do. So just some quick examples here of what that might look like. Okay, we don't unfortunately have time for more videos, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, so we end each session where we started, how we started with going back to our plan. We're making a plan of how the parent wants to keep practicing, what it is, when, where, and with whom. Again, the partners that the people that make up um, that are that make up that 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 unit for the family and that are important and a part of the child's lives. And I think as we put together that plan, it helps to confirm or to help clarify mutual understanding and agreement that we're on the same page of again like what the priorities from the parent what they want to do with this um, and what could potentially stand in their way the problem-solving aspect to help work through those barriers before they turn into bigger issues is is really critical and that's something I can say from personal experience I didn't always ask I didn't always ask what could stand in the way of you doing this I certainly vis um, reflected with the parent once they brought it up, but I didn't always anticipate and work that in ahead of time, and I do that now. And as we get into a plan, again, pulling up, sharing your screen and pulling up visual information. So this week, I, being the parent or other caregiver, I will practice setting up activities with my child, not just setting it all up and then calling my child over, but again, pulling my child into those interactive moments for learning and doing something in each of those opportunities. Uh, what I want to see from my child um, in the coming week is this, you know, following directions, pointing to the objects he wants or where he wants them to go. Some parents would, you know, like ways to track what they see happening at home or in other, um, uh, other places where they, you know, where, where children are. And so if, if sending, you know, if creating um, charts or, or lists, um, things that can go in the family home that are visible to the parents on the ref we always call them refrigerator lists in early start Denver model but that they can tape to the fridge or um, I've had parents share with me they tape to the bathroom mirror because it's it's a place they go to often and they see that see it and it reminds them what they want to do so you know how how can parents help again gauge um, on a on a frequent basis what what it is what's happening for them do they want to text you know that's another way and i think it's important as a coach to ask for feedback too you know around the session structure around the types of materials you're sharing around the communication style especially again um, because we're at a distance and that technology can unintentionally kind of create some barriers that we don't want to uh, uh, that we don't want to stay so as much as we as coaches try to have everything go smoothly, considerations like anything else in life have to sometimes be made. And I wanna just talk through a couple that have happened for me and my experience in coaching families uh, with telehealth. And the one is that, the first one that stands out is how coaches and parents can talk, um, particularly when the coach isn't in the same room to help support a child. So I've had many telehealth sessions where as much as, as, as I would love and I know the parent would love for the child to be involved in the entire, uh, and my sessions are usually hour long, so involved in the entire hour long session, it's just not feasible for the child to do that. Um, or, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to keep a child engaged, especially if you're just staying in one room in the house. So, let's so ways that i've worked through that is that we might start the session with the child present and go into the parent um, sharing something right away from the plan so i can observe it and then maybe doing a quick a little bit of quick coaching but i'm careful about how much coaching i do because again i haven't gotten the full story i haven't had the parent talk with me yet um, to fill in the holes from what i'm seeing but we start with the child nonetheless and then uh, when there's a, a good breaking point, um, we the child will leave the session. And now this would work better if there's other adults in the house to help 
uh, occupy and manage the child um, so that then the, the rest of the time, the session time, I can talk with the parent and get, again, the rest of the picture. So starting with the child and then ending with the parent or reversing the order and talking with the parent before the child um, comes into the picture to then observe and, and practice right away. So I just wanna throw out those two possible variations. Um, when, another time that can be difficult to talk is when you're trying to explain your coaching content. And again, you know, how we manage the child during the talking time is really important to the success of a session. So sometimes we have to break up our talking points into chunks. And with this visual here, you know, let's say this is the whole content I would like to practice and, and, and support a parent to use. I might have to um, break it into strategies that work well together and explain those. Um, so the two, the two with the red arrows are the first two I would talk through and help the parent think how they wanna practice it and then practice that with the child and reflect. And now I'll pull this list back up and now let's go into the next two points listed there to add gestures um, and to exaggerate facial expressions. Let's talk about that real quickly and now we're gonna practice that. So chunking information can sometimes be a way to make communication slightly faster and therefore easier. Sometimes I've found that children actually are not, um, or that it's not feasible to coach um, and practice with children directly in a session. Maybe the session's been scheduled when a child falls accidentally is asleep. It's, you know, it's too close to nap time or bedtime. Um, or the child, you know, from the parent's stance is just not in a place to practice. And so how else can we still go for, forward with coaching information and tools to support the parent when the child's not available or not there in the session? And I think that's where, us showing video if we have the ability to do that and the permission to do that is possible. So with Zoom, for anyone using the HIPAA compliant um, version of Zoom with their families and you want to share video, but the video is not um, playing well for the family. I didn't know this. It took me forever to find. But when you go to share your screen, as you see here on this um, on the example um, on my screen, you need to click share computer sound and that makes a world of difference for a parent or whomever you're trying to share video with, actually be able to hear the video and see it synced as they're watching it. So anyway, a little quick tip. Um, so watching video of what that could look like, followed by then talking through, again, the planning part. How, do the par how does the parent wanna use it? Um, what's, or, sorry, what's happened since last time, since your last session? And then how does the parent wanna practice this new information or this new idea? And from their practice, what do they wanna see from their child? So we can still, again, if we can't directly practice or help a parent practice directly with a child, let's talk through the content and the ideas and the way that a parent can still move forward. And then other times parents will bring up topics, you know, other topics that don't relate to our current coaching focus, but they're still important. They're still important for us to hear and to acknowledge and to try to work through with parents. But, but we don't, as a coach, we don't want to lose the, the structure or the order of a session because if we lose that organization, we're really not helping parents. We're just kind of going to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and we're not really getting anywhere with any of the needs. So having a way to and I use a visual here, like what you see on your screen, having a visual parking lot to, you know, as the parent brings up things to say, okay, yes, you wanna talk about this, that's important. Okay, let me park it here and I'll type it out on, on, on the, um, the, the handout I have on, our, on, the shared, on the screen I've shared with the parent. I'll type it out to say, I hear you, I, I have it here and I'm gonna make time um, before our session ends to go back to this topic and so that we can discuss it adequately. And if you don't have a time, time in session or if the, if the time in a session runs out and you haven't been able to get to that parking lot, then what I like to do is at least touch on when I'm gonna revisit that topic with the parent. Am I gonna call the parent? Um, are we gonna start off with that topic at the next session? What's gonna be a way that we can reconnect over that? So in summary, there's my hope is that you can see some potential benefits of using telehealth to help families help their children. That we can connect with families when access is an issue to, um, to traditional in-person sessions, um, or that the use of telehealth has the 
potential for us as coaches to see more, to interact with other family members that maybe don't get to come to, you know, in-person sessions or be a part of them, to see uh, different rooms and spaces inside and outside of the family's home and to see more activities and routines and ultimately to get a sense of the family's lifestyle. We really, with families, you know, comfort level and permission, we, they can really invite us in to see a lot. We have lots of, of flexibility in using technology um, to help everyone, help everyone learn and to uh, reorganize our session structure to meet the needs of parents and children as well as when we're working from home, if we have that ability to maybe play around with our our availability, our scheduling, and to be able to connect with um, with families at more convenient times for them. And if we're not working in a clinic or a, or a center, um, you know that might uh, uh, result in less overhead costs, and certainly not adding on the um, transportation expenses. But there's also drawbacks to telehealth. And so I, I, I want to acknowledge those that, you know, for families who have limited or no service, internet or cellular service, telehealth is going to be really hard to do because we can't have that signal chopping, you know, our ability to talk and hear and see each other. Uh, I've also had families where telehealth is just, just not fitting their learning style or what their needs are or their child's needs compared to in-person services. And I want to end by saying, by no means do I think telehealth should replace in-person services. I do think it's just another option um, for the reasons I've shared. Lastly, I'm going to leave you with uh, these different sites and um, links to telehealth resources in response to COVID-19. Um, particularly, the top one has enforcement guidelines of how to use telehealth um, in, in a, in a health-related practice. Uh, and just some great information there um, to, to reference. And so closing thoughts is that in early intervention, what we do with families has not changed, but because of the pandemic, how it looks has. And so telehealth may work for some families. And I think the way that we approach and decide that is using our clinical judgment, as well as asking and listening families because they know themselves the best. We have some questions, and I, yes. I we still have time to answer a few questions. Absolutely. I know we're at the end of the hour. So the first question that I got, some of these came via email, and others were typed in the question section. If people are still wanting to ask any questions, you can type them there now. Okay. Uh, the first question is about motivating parents. So using reinforcers, you talked quite a bit about just you know motivating verbally. Have you found any sort of between session strategies you've used or things that you find to be sort of your key, most effective strategies if you've got a mom or dad who's getting a little discouraged? Motivating parents to keep practicing in between sessions? Is sure, the and, and okay. to, to try to keep keep it up even when maybe it's not going as perfectly as they'd hope. Yeah, oh, I've certainly experienced that. I what I What I try to do is the goals that we set, you know, the goals that become the plan, we want to achieve success. We want parents to experience good feelings about that as soon as possible. And so I think at the top of, of that list on what we do as coaches is to make sure what we're setting is realistic for families to practice and to achieve. And if we have a big goal, and I'll just use like talking, like a child talking, that's an important goal, of course. But based on where the child is in development, maybe talking isn't going to be the first benchmark that a parent you know can accomplish in a week and we need to divide our our goals our important milestones into the doable steps that parents can start to work on right away and in a lot of opportunities the more practice we get the more hopefully we're going to start to see some 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 the differences the, the the changes that parents want so setting realistic setting a realistic plan is number one i think checking in with parents in between sessions if it can be, you know, a text, um, if it's a call, if it's an email, um, if or and this is, again, going back to shared input, asking parents, how can I help? You know, what's going to help in between our time together to uh, to just support you? You know, how can I support you in between? That's what comes to mind right now. OK, the next question, and this is one I've heard from a lot of parents. Um, this is from a person who's actually a therapist. She's asking about strategies to increase eye contact and redirect attention span. And 
adding to that, this is another person's question, but what to do when a child really just does not like seeing themselves on video or like interacting on video with a therapist? So some kids are very resistant mm -hmm. to that. So have you had any experiences similar to that? I, again, think it's about, I mean, uh, 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 well, I, I guess, a goal with this talk was to think about how to move away from just modeling with a child. And so how can we help share those tools um, and those strategies with parents um, to work on the goals, you know, we, we want to, we want children to develop. Um, I do think it's hard to look at a screen for a while. And I, I mean, I, I can't get into that because there's so much I would need to know about a child and what has been tried before and, you know, what kinds of, of materials on the coach's side um, they, they have available to make the screen inviting to a child. But I guess the bigger picture for me is how do we, you know, the point of this talk was how to help use other coaching tools besides just ourselves to increase children's skills. And that is with parents and other adults important in that child's life inside the things that parents and children are doing together. All right, and if they're looking for specific, very specific strategies that they can teach parents about increasing eye contact yeah. or redirecting attention yes. span, is there an online resource, and you may have mentioned it during the talk, or is there somewhere they can look for some ideas about that? Absolutely, that I can be 100% clear on. So going to, there's a slide where, I, um, and I can link these um, in, the, in the slide handouts I share, going to Help is in Your Hands, it's a free, um, online resource. It has videos and text modules on these different social communication skills that are important uh, to teach to teach children at, at young ages. Um, Affirm, A-F-I-R-M, is another one uh, that has lots of evidence-based modules uh, that, again, is free for parents and professionals to access. Um, Project Impact may have something. Um, I know they have they have traditional books and 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 but I can't think at the moment if they have online materials, I apologize. But then the last one is the navigator. Um, so I'll make sure I, I link those in the handouts. That'd be great, thank you for doing that. Uh, the next question is meaningful metrics. So you talk a little bit about, you know, some parents wanna have charts. They, mm -hmm. They'd like to have their little chart where they're tracking things. Um, for, from your perspective, is it really important that parents be taking data all the time or is it okay if, some parents really enjoy that and other parents that's yeah. not their thing. Um, I know for a lot of behavioral programs, sometimes that's a real focus. So how is this ESTM practice different or how do you approach that with your families? I ask, I mean, I want to help explain what, uh, having parent, having the, the feedback and the input from the parent about what they've seen is important. But I do think that there's different ways to collect that. And I think we, you know, if we want to engage parents and motivate them to share with us, we need to be flexible and we need to um, have, you know, other ways just besides paper and pencil tracking methods that could help. So um, it's a conversation. It's a conversation to have with parents to help explain why it is important because there is there is a rationale for it, absolutely, but how we might do that together. And if a parent ultimately is just, you know, it's not um, compatible with, with how a parent operates or it's not compatible with a family's lifestyle, then I think we have to, as coaches, again, modify our expectations. And at the very least, we, we want to reserve time then for parents to tell us, you know, when, when our sessions or, or somehow um, and to share verbally the information with us. Okay. This is a therapist. She says, I catch myself coaching. I know I'm, I need to get better at resisting that. How can oh. I teach myself to stop? So she's saying that, oh. she, yeah. <laughs> how do I teach myself to stop doing that? Well, okay. Let me just clarify. Coaching is important. Like we, again, when we think about the partnership between coaches and families, it's, there's a duality there. So we, as the coach have inform information to share and it's important and vital. We just don't want to always be leading. We want to make room, create the space for parents to also contribute information. So just to make sure I, I reiterate that. Now, if we're always leading, if maybe that's what this person means by coaching, um, one, and I relate to that, one thing I do is I go back and I watch 
my sessions for those that I can record. I watch my sessions and I watch myself. That's one strategy because I think video modeling can be an important um, coaching and feedback tool for all of us. So one idea. The other thing I do is when I plan my sessions and I have you know, my planning sheet, I will write on it, uh, ask parent first, you know, or I'll write out my questions or my statements that help prompt me, that help remind me what it is I actually wanna do in the session. So I would offer those two ideas to the person. Okay, I think we have time for just one more. This person's asking what to do if uh, a parent sort of gets stuck on preferred activities because they have the most success. So they're having success with certain activities and yeah. it's hard to help them see that, that sort of growing into the next activity is important. I would wonder what kind of skill, or okay, I would wonder what would be an incentive to help the parent take, a, take small steps at first into other things. So maybe we're not going from preferred activities to now the least preferred activity, because that might be too big of a stretch, but can we go to something that maybe is preferred but doesn't happen as often for the child? Um, you know, the child still likes it, it's just not a regularly, a regularly occurring activity every day for the child. Or maybe something that the that is new to the child, but the parent thinks, I think the child could like that. So it's novel, it still could be preferred, but it has the novelty to still allow some generalization around that. So I would think about moving in steps. And again, ask the parent. Help the parent understand why it's important to start having some variety in there and then work together on how the parent, on how you and the parent can do that in a comfortable way together. Okay, can I squeeze in one more? Of course. All right, this parent has the, um, <clears throat> or this, this provider is working with adolescents. And I know that you've worked with early start, so this is a little bit different, but he's asking about tips to increase participation for those who struggle with attention. So just maintaining attention um, and not the parent, but the, the teen struggles with attention. So what are strategies that you teach parents to help keep attention going? Well, motivating, what's motivating to the person, what kinds of choices can we work in where the person, the learner, the ch uh, older child or young adult, um, adolescent, you know, what kinds of choices can they make where the, through the choices we're working on skills, but we're still following um, the adolescent's interest to keep them in the activity, in, inside the activity. Um, I think, attention, attention, I would, yeah, I think about, I mean, we might have, again, ways that we want to elaborate or vary or add on to something, but if we don't have the person's attention and motivation, we really can't get that far with it. So I would make sure that um, that maybe, you know, in the at this point in the learning relationship, we're, we as the coach or the provider are doing more following, you know, based around the adolescent's interests and working in our learning opportunities around the choices and those interests that are keeping the um, the learner there. And then when we want to try something that's a little different, that's outside of that scope, it might be that we, again, the partner, uh, the coach or the, or the provider or the parent, that we model that other skill or that other idea in our turn for the adolescent to just watch for the time being, to just watch and to tolerate. So not requiring that adolescent to meet that skill or, or, or repeat or imitate that skill, but at first just to develop tolerance of a little bit of, of, of variation. And then we go back to following and choices and working on skills with that. And then, okay, now I'm gonna, again, introduce a little variation here, just on my side, just in my turn. So we're working out this slight you know, new ratio and then gradually trying to equalize it. 